Uh, good afternoon, uh, everybody, and uh, uh, welcome uh, to this uh, debate, uh, which is going to be looking today uh, at right-wing extremism and radicalization, and in particular, the role of uh, disinformation and social media in helping these uh, right-wing extreme extremist groups uh, to form, uh, to promote themselves, to spread their messages and, and to recruit their adherents. Uh, I'm Jamie Shea, Senior Fellow at Friends of Europe, uh, speaking to you uh, live, of course, uh, here at Town Hall uh, Europe in the heart of uh, uh, Brussels. Thank you, as always, for joining us. And uh, this is our first uh, policy insight uh, since uh, the uh, end of the summer break, although the weather in Brussels uh, today is so sunny that it suggests that that summer break is continuing. But, of course, it isn't. We're all back at work uh, and ready for the new uh, season of Friends of Europe uh, Policy uh, Insights. Uh, so uh, I'm very pleased, as I said, to be able to moderate today's uh, discussion. Uh, the key question, I suppose, at least at the back of my mind, is that if the internet suddenly disappeared uh, tomorrow uh, in some cosmic uh, cyber attack or breakdown, uh, would right-wing radical groups still exist? or at least uh, uh, in any significant form. Uh, now, that is probably not a very realistic or maybe even sensible question. So more uh, realistically and more pragmatically today, uh, I am suggesting to our three speakers, who I will introduce in just a moment, that we focus on three uh, policy issues, or at least I think issues which would be uppermost in the minds of policymakers uh, here in Brussels uh, and beyond. Firstly, uh, what is the role of disinformation uh, in helping uh, the whole process of radicalization. Uh, as I mentioned, the constitution of groups, uh, the uh, way in which they spread uh, and recruit, the way in which they gain a larger audience or impact uh, for their uh, uh, messages. In other words, how important is disinformation, particularly online, in social media, vis-a-vis -vis other factors at play uh, in terms of uh, the uh, evolution of right-wing radical uh, groups. Uh, secondly, of course, what is the scale of the problem? Uh, is it getting worse? Is it getting uh, better? Uh, what are the disinformation vehicles and how do they operate? Uh, we've all heard about QAnon, of course, which has had on both sides of the Atlantic its fair share of publicity in recent times. But what about the uh, others. So, you know, what's the landscape? How does it look? And then thirdly, and again, no prizes for originality here, but I think it's what our audience will be interested in learning, is how effective are the responses thus far uh, of governments? Of course, here in Brussels, we'll be looking at the European Union, the European Parliament, but also, you know, civil society, NGOs, uh, uh, interested and activist citizens groups who obviously uh, want to counter uh, extremist uh, narratives uh, and build a more constructive uh, uh, narrative of, of, of their own. What are the lessons learned uh, in terms of the strategies to deal with disinformation uh, so far? Now, uh, fortunately, I don't have to provide any of the answers uh, to these questions. Uh, I'm delighted that uh, we have three people today who really can provide the answers. Uh, I, I call them three of the best, and believe me, this is absolutely uh, no exaggeration. Firstly, uh, from London today, we have Sasha uh, Havlicek. Uh, Sasha is uh, very well known both in Brussels and internationally uh, as an expert on all of these issues, co-founder and chief executive officer at the Institute for Strategic Dialogue. So uh, welcome, Sasha. Secondly, we have Fadi Kuran, who is the campaigns director of AVAZ, A-V-A-A-Z. I'm sure that uh, Fadi will explain exactly what that is uh, when I turn to him for his remarks. Uh, and he's speaking to us today from Ramallah. Uh, so welcome, uh, Fadi. Uh, and then thirdly, uh, I mentioned the uh, necessary EU-European par Parliament perspective. So I'm delighted that we have also Maria uh, Muniz de Urquiza. Uh, Maria, uh, if I uh, have shown how bad my Spanish pronunciation 
pronunciation is, please forgive me. Henceforth, it will be Maria, which will be much easier for me. But Maria, uh, as everybody knows, you're a former member of the European Parliament. You're currently advisor to the Socialists and Democrats group in the European Parliament. You're particularly active on the Committee of the Parliament that deals with foreign influence in democratic processes. Uh, and I'm particularly pleased to welcome you uh, back to Friends of Europe because in 2017 you were a young uh, European leader uh, in our Middle East and North Africa uh, uh, program. So hopefully all of this is very familiar uh, to you. Now, I am asking each of our speakers to uh, make some introductory comments, uh, five to seven minutes. Uh, uh, obviously, dear audience, the aim is to have a discussion, uh, not a series of lectures. Uh, so I hope our speakers will keep to that. I will do my very, very best to remind them. Uh, we'll have, uh, 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 first of all, uh, Sasha uh, and Fadi, uh, uh, to get us going. Then I'll invite some questions uh, from you, dear audience, so that we can break up at least the initial flow uh, of introductions. Uh, then we'll go to Maria. Then, of course, in the time remaining, because we have just one hour today, uh, we will bring in others' questions. Uh, I ask everybody, of course, first of all, to indicate clearly in the usual way that you're all familiar with now with these virtual uh, meetings uh, to uh, raise the hand or to communicate via hashtag FOE debate. Uh, but let us know you want to come in so that I know that you're out there. Please also volunteer early uh, because that will help me to uh, bring you uh, in. Um, and uh, that, I think, is all that you need to hear from me, uh, at least from now. Uh, the parameters have been set. Let's get straight into the discussion. Let's get straight into the many insights that I know we're going to have today. So, Sasha, uh, the virtual microphone has wound its way from Brussels to London, uh, and uh, it's over to you. And again, like uh, to you and all, uh, all the speakers, uh, a heartfelt thanks uh, for agreeing to be part of this discussion today. Sasha, please. Um, campaigns, keeping migrants out of Europe, free speech, anti-multiculturalism and so on, and, and of course campaigning around elections, which we've seen in a really effective way. The second thing is that um, they their communications have quite successfully been boosted by the propaganda machineries, both overt and covert, of hostile states. And that intersection, I think, is really important to understand uh, and to get our heads around more, as well as by what we've seen as a, as a kind of vast, burgeoning conspiracy space online. It's now more and more difficult to separate out these different malign actors, state, non-state, domestic, international, commercial, political, all in some shape or another seeking to sow division uh, and undermine liberal democracy. And, and they borrow from each other's playbooks. We've seen this threat essentially become increasingly hybridized. 
the boundaries between disinformation, conspiracy theory, targeted hate, harassment, violent extremism are increasingly blurred. And so I just give you a couple of examples in the 2017 federal uh, elections in Germany. We, my research team, our digital analysis unit uncovered how international alt-right and Kremlin information assets were effectively reinforcing each other's content and narratives, often through coordinated inauthentic means in support of the IFD. We saw that full grab bag of disinfo tactics that we came to associate with the Kremlin in almost you know, all the bad actors' hands, from coordinated promotion of fake content or lies to fake identities and fake distribution, you know, sock puppet accounts, this kind of thing, um, in full effect, for instance, in the 2019 EP elections. And we see this over and over. We saw this in the US and the US elections and so on. And we continue as researchers to uncover large-scale information operations, often transnationally operated, reaching millions and millions of people, often with a clear um, purpose to polarize communities with false information, for instance, ahead of elections, but the targets are everything from migration policy to climate. Um, and then, of course, COVID became the sort of boon for conspiracy networks and thinking. And, and our researchers showed how conspiracy content increased by 160% on Facebook in March of 2020 alone. Boom. QAnon, you mentioned, became a kind of crucible, helping engage new audiences and connect really quite disparate networks from anti-vax networks, anti-5G conspiracy uh, groups, anti-lockdown, anti-Semitic, anti-migrant extremist networks connecting the dots really across those spaces. And the result was really significant visible expansion in the engagement and reach of extreme groups. We saw, for instance, hate groups expanded their reach in German language by 18% during, lock during the lockdown periods um, in COVID. Um, so German language. It, similarly, anti-Semitism study for the European Commission that we did online showed a 13-fold increase in anti-Semitism again, in German language content uh, during the pandemic. Thirdly, and, and this comes, I think, to the final point, the, the distortion of our information ecosystem resulting from the business model of social media, the algorithmic amplification and promotion of hate on social media. And, and I think there's two parts of what's going wrong here with social media platforms. One is that big tech, tech companies are still by and large failing to enforce their own rules on disinformation hate and extremist content well enough and and when you get outside of the of the context which are really being scrutinized heavily by media by governments the west that that record gets worse uh, and we've got plenty of um evidence showing that i mean just a recent um piece of investigation we did with the guardian um, showed that content denying Russian atrocities in Bucha had been shared significantly more on Facebook across 20 countries than the truth. And none of the posts contained a fact check label, despite all the commitments that Facebook has made to do just that. Another investigation showed that um, Putin's super fans on Facebook were, you know, this sprawling network of pro Putin groups were achieving massive engagement rates in the many millions, despite the profiles of users in this group bearing all the hallmark of fake accounts. Again, something that the social media companies have promised to do better, you know, to, to, to deal with. But really, ultimately, the worst of all is that the technological architecture of these, of these platforms, the products and the systems, including the recommendations, algorithms and systems, are essentially inorganically amplifying, promoting harmful, extreme and misleading content often targeting that worst of that content to the users that are likely to be most vulnerable to it. And we found through ISD's research how Facebook, TikTok, even Amazon recommender systems, you, you know, direct users to everything from Holocaust denial to misogynist to white supremacist content. Facebook's own uh, Al Facebook's own research that was leaked in 2018 showed that 64% of joins to extremist groups were, were a result of their own recommendations algorithm, which is not a free speech environment. It's a curated speech environment. And the result of that is that bad content outpaces good. 
Research by SD conducted in 2020 saw that content from known COVID disinformation sites got 13 times more engagement on Facebook than CDC and WHO content combined. And so we see this across a number of different verticals. And the result is that yeah. what was once on the fringe has essentially become mainstream. Uh, Sasha, that's a, a very good uh, uh, note to uh, conclude your introductory remarks. Thank you very much. I mean, you've obviously yourself and uh, your institute done a tremendous amount of research and you cited this and uh, presumably uh, that's accessible to people uh, here today and the general public uh, via your website. Good uh, to mention that uh, next time you come along uh, into the debate because uh, as I said uh, there's a lot of you know, very very interesting research that some people may want to go into in greater uh, depth. It's interesting that you talk about the way in which uh, uh, the right-wing groups link up with mainstream issues very successfully, the blurring of the lines in terms of different issues interconnecting, uh, the need for a booster like COVID uh, that really does uh, take this to a whole new uh, level. Um, and indeed, uh, despite all of the uh, debate about regulation of social media, uh, and guidelines and codes of ethics and Mark Zuckerberg uh, testifying to Congress and to the European Parliament and God knows what, uh, the rather depressing conclusion that these uh, companies don't follow their own rules and much obviously remains to be done. Sasha, thanks for getting us off to a, a very good start. Uh, hear from you, as I said, in the Q&A in just a moment. So let's now go directly to Ramallah and have a perspective from a different part of the world uh, on this issue. Uh, again, I'm delighted to welcome Fadi uh, Kuran. Uh, and Fadi, as I said, I mentioned that you uh, are the campaigns director for Avaz, and maybe you'll want to spend not much of your seven to eight minutes, but maybe just a couple of seconds telling us all what that uh, group uh, is and does. Fadi, uh, the microphone is yours. Thank you so much for the introduction, and thank you all for being here. So let me start just a one minute introduction to Avaz. Avaz was created as an online civic movement over 15 years ago with the idea that if we connect the people across the world towards specific goals and campaigns in a democratic process where our members, people around the world, choose the issues that they care about, then we would be able to create transformative change. And now we have about 70 million members all over the world. And the way we campaign is we poll our members. We ask them, what are the key issues that we should be working on? Um, and our members also fund us, so we're not controlled by any other actor. But how this relates to the work on disinformation specifically is after 2016, our members in every country from Brazil to India to South Africa and to Europe told us that disinformation, the rise of the kind of far right extremism, it is making them feel in danger. And we should begin figuring out what solutions there are to this rising and increasing trend. And that's one of us focused a significant amount of our resources to not only study and analyze the rise of disinformation, but to develop key tools that can help mitigate this threat and put it back uh, in, in the box where it belongs. And what I want to speak to all of you about today is actually first put you in the information ecosystem uh, mindset or thinking that a, a person radicalized to the far right or far left for that matter, mm. uh, can get into. So play, play along with me for a moment. And I want you to think about one political issue that you care deeply about. It could be LGBTQ rights, it could be climate change, um, whatever issue comes to mind. All right. We, we've been thinking. That, yes, uh, hopefully everyone now has that specific thing in mind, that political issue in mind. Now, what we're going to do is just think for one minute, we're just taking 60 seconds here, think of how you developed that political position, what books you read, what newspapers you followed, who were the people in, in your life that gave you information on this issue that helped you develop that political position. So note that down, we'll take 30 seconds of silence for you all to do that. All right. We're thinking again yeah. these are interesting yeah. questions to ask us exactly and w the reason i want people to note these down is now think about where do you get news on these issues about 
Now, if you take just a few moments and you think about currently today, where do you read about these issues? Where do you get the updates from? Now, what you will realize as you do that is a lot of the political positions, each one listening um, on this call, and most people around the world have, are based on an information ecosystem. And unless you're kind of really smart or a sage and kind of, you know, spend a lot of time alone without having all that input, which almost nobody else does these days, your ideas are influenced by that information. Now, what's happening today in our modern world, one of the key aspects of danger is we look at, for example, teenagers and people um, in their 20s, and the data shows that they are spending about six to seven hours per day on their phones, looking mainly at social media content. Now, you also have a lot of actors that realize, and this is the trade of spreading disinformation and, and propaganda and influencing people's political narratives is not new, it is very old. But you have a lot of actors investing, whether they are you know, Putin and the Russian government, or whether they are local actors such as the alt-right, you know, the Proud Boys, Steve Bannon, and, and those mm -hmm. different groups in the US, or the, the far right across Europe. They're investing in figuring out what type of content and information can we put out to European citizens that actually connects with people's daily experiences, right? So if there's a person in, in Europe, let's take Sweden for an example, if there's a 60 year old man in Sweden today that has lost their job to something related to um, personal issues, but then sees that the person that took their job is an immigrant, someone who came to Sweden, let's say in the last 10 or 20 years, then these actors have found ways to use social media to tie that person's you know, individual frustrations um, around losing their job with a narrative that is much broader than just them and that person, but that relates to being anti-immigrant, to these people stealing the jobs in the country. And what happens is, consistently, what we saw early in the spread of this information, let's say from 2015 onward, is there were specific posts, and there were specific pieces of content for example, one of the things we found in 2019 during the EU elections was a lot of content, fake disinformation, claims about immigrants raping um, mm. essentially European women. Now, what's happened, though, is that as these actors spread these stories, these sensationalist stories, they have them created ecosystems, bubbles, and they've used Facebook groups, they've used WhatsApp groups, they use Telegram, et cetera, et cetera, to create these bubbles of narratives um, and within these bubbles you have individuals that now believe in the same meta narrative a narrative about immigrants stealing our jobs and for you to understand the reach of this in a study that avaz did in the us in an official poll we found that for example 85 percent of americans had read content um, about the us elections or and polling process being rigged that us elections were rigged 85 percent of americans saw content saying that before the elections on social media. So you can understand just the scale of social media that didn't exist in the past where you can reach so many people. And all you need to really radicalize is you need 3% of the people you're reaching to believe parts of the story and then to enter into your bubble narrative and to start engaging with similar content to be able to create an extremist fringe within uh, our societies. Now, where I'm going with this is, first of all, we need to understand the formation of these ecosystems and understand that the people that enter them, a large misconception is that the people that enter these ecosystems are evil people or people who would have anyways wanted to harm their fellow citizens and believe this type of stuff. And that's not the case. They're mainly people who feel disenfranchised, whether truthfully or not, but feel disenfranchised that needs a narrative to help them understand what's happening in their lives. And they are being fed this narrative on these platforms. But there's something that can easily be done about this, and hopefully the digital services- Absolutely, Fadi. Solutions yeah. are what we'll uh, definitely want to hear. Uh, I need to ask you to uh, wrap up your initial remarks quickly, but you said that there is something easily that could be done about it. So do you want to set, tell us in just two sentences as uh, you wrap up your first uh, set of remarks, uh, what that uh, hopefully easy solution might be? Yeah, and, and this is a solution specifically in relation to 
social media platforms. And hopefully the European Digital Services Act will help us get there, which is opening up the black boxes of social media algorithms and understanding research, researching how these algorithms are influencing the ecosystems that are being created around this type of radical content and breaking them open so that people are pushed out of these bubbles into other spaces for extended periods of time. So it's not just about one correction, etc., but it's more about redesigning the architecture of social media today. And so it's a solution that's on the table, but it's one that requires a lot of work. And I'll uh stop there. Okay, uh, Fadi, thank you very much, much indeed. Uh, so uh, we uh, now come to uh, questions, and I'm going to uh, kick off now, uh, as I mentioned before, with uh, our young uh, audience uh, from um, uh, Debating Europe. Um, uh, we've got Luca, who points out that disinformation may play a role in far-right radicalization, but also the system is failing to fulfill people's needs. Luca says, I quote, we measure wealth with GDP, but we don't really look at the Gini index. Are underlying economic factors making people more receptive to radicalization? Pardon me? Nobody's listening. Oh, sorry, I've been uh, cut off, have I? Uh, can I continue? Recording in progress. Uh, uh, welcome back, everybody. Sorry, I think we had a little technical glitch here. I was told that uh, uh, you couldn't hear me. Um, it's more important you listen to the speakers than me, of course, but still as a moderator, I suppose I need to uh, be heard. Um, so hopefully we're all back up. Thanks for your patience. Um, uh, so uh, I wanted uh, in the first question to bring in one of our uh, young debating uh, Europe uh, viewers, uh, Luca. Uh, Luca points out that disinformation uh, may play a role in far-right radicalization, but also wonders if it's perhaps the economic and social system that is failing to fulfill people's needs and which is responsible. Uh, uh, Luca says, we measure wealth with GDP, but we don't really look at the Gini index. Are underlying economic factors making people more receptive to radicalization? Now, Fadi, you, you sort of uh, mentioned this a little bit, the notion of isolation, the notion of disenfranchisement. Maybe it's the fact that you know, civil society, people's participation uh, in social life, in political activity, uh, in charities, whatever, isn't perhaps what it used to be. I'm not sure if this is true, but it's often said. So I'd like to uh, ask our three speakers, uh, 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 Sasha, as uh, obviously you spoke first, uh, so anybody please, uh, is there some sort of truth in, in all of this? Uh, that it's, uh, if you like, the, uh, the more isolated somebody is, the more cut off that person is, the fewer social contacts, the more sort of enclosed in the internet bubble, the more that person uh, becomes susceptible to disinformation? Or is it really anybody, you know, even people who are uh, gainfully employed full time with families and lots of friends and active social life who also uh, are uh, potential victims as well? Anyway, uh, that's Luca's question. So uh, our three speakers, Sasha, do you want to say something about that right from the, uh, the get go? And then I'll also ask Maria if she wants to add something on that. Uh, before we move to another question and then Maria's intervention. Thanks so much, Jamie. Yes, I mean, we've been studying radicalization and, and actually working with individuals um, who entered into extremist organizations and groups and have left those groups over time, so former extremists, um, for about 15 years now. And there are many, many, many different drivers um, of extremism, if you like, the push factors are multifold. And one of the things that I think is very important is it is very difficult to narrowly profile individuals from, let's say, either a socioeconomic perspective um, or a gender perspective, um, or certainly a religious or ethnic perspective. And um, so you see people 
um, joining these movements for many different reasons. But there is no question that disaffection, disenfranchisement, of course, is one of the grievances that extremist movements and the subcultures that we've talked about online prey on. The idea of being uh, part of a group, part of a, a part of a team, um, part of uh, a special truth um, in the context of conspiracy, part of accessing information that other people might not know. These are very important aspects of the draw for some people into these environments. Um, but I would say one of the, you know, I think you've got other uh, comments here in the in the in the questions. There are many different things that need to happen mm -hmm. in order for us to be able to both identify individuals on a pathway to radicalization um, and potentially violent extremism. Um, and part of that is building the infrastructure offline uh, within communities, within society to be able to identify and intervene. And that has to really be built up bottom up. Friends, family, schools, social services, healthcare services need equipping with the tools and with the training and with the systems to intervene. It's a lot of work that ISD does around the world, often with cities, but also with central governments. The online piece of things has become a bigger part of the radicalization process than ever before. And it is probably set to continue to be a very large part of what we see. And we are increasingly seeing people radicalized with no sort of formal affiliation to extremist groups. This kind of post-organizational terrorism, post-organizational extremism is a factor that we need to uh, engage with. And that means interventions into some of these environments that we see online. And I, I do think that there, you know, we've trialed and tested some of these um, fairly effectively. I think, again, I would say from a system standpoint, we need better regulation. And I'd love to talk about the DSA. There's some very interesting stuff coming um, you know, really being led uh, for us in, you know, by Europe on uh, on this front, I think really worthwhile looking into into that in more depth. Uh, thanks, Sasha. Uh, I want to bring in Maria for her, uh, her major intervention in just a second. But Maria, uh, I think I should also put the question to you because Fadi sort of also raised it. So he sort of answered his own question already. Uh, the question that then came from Luca. But for Maria, in terms of your uh, role uh, in the European Parliament. Do you also sort of take this line of disenfranchisement, uh, the notion of the individual sort of a little bit isolated in the community uh, uh, is a particular sort of phenomenon uh, to worry about? And the answer it lies in somehow a very difficult process of sort of strengthening communities and strengthening society. Has this resonated with the discussions that you have had so far in the Parliament, Maria? Is Maria there? Maria, I'm mute. Yeah, can you hear me? Get, yeah, no, we could. We can now. Uh, hopefully, ah, you, okay. you, hopefully you heard my question. Please go ahead. Yeah, yeah, I heard it. The, yeah, I said that it would be a simplification to attribute the growing presence of extreme right in governments or in institutions and uh, hand in hand with these messages of uh, distrust and disengagement of citizens from the institutions and from democracy, it would be a simplification to attribute that just to uh, disinformation or foreign interferences. The, the problem is uh, deeper, I think, under the economic crisis, the... Uh, sorry, uh, we've lost Maria. Dear audience, I'm afraid we've lost Maria. So she's there. Can you hear her? Uh, you can. Oh, sorry. I couldn't hear her. Ah. Thank 
Thanks, Maria. Um, let's go for a quick second question, and then, Maria, after that, it'll be the time for your own intervention. Uh, again, from one of our uh, young... Uh, yes, we did. It came across perfectly. Thanks for your patience. Um, the second question, uh, as again, uh, from one of our Debating Europe uh, young uh, uh, listeners, viewers, it's Andras. Andras from Hungary. Uh, he points out that it's sometimes the governments themselves... You can't hear me. They, they can't hear me? Oh, you can hear me? We've lost me again, sorry. Recording in progress. Uh, okay. Excuse me. Uh, uh, I, I, I seem to be back on, sorry. Uh, uh, did, you, did you hear me? Uh, Maria, yes, we could hear you. And uh, uh, allow me to, uh, we heard you very well. Uh, okay. I will ask you just to be patient for just a moment uh, before we turn to you. Uh, a very quick answer, uh, maybe Fadi you'd like to come in on this one too. Uh, a, a second question from one of our young uh, debating Europe viewers, Andras from Hungary. He points out that sometimes it's the governments themselves, and we obviously think of the years of Donald Trump in the United States, uh, and uh, Andras is looking at his own government in Hungary in his question, uh, and the state media that are promoting the disinformation. So uh, what can we do about that, uh, 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 state media and governments? Uh, Fadi, uh, uh, any, any thoughts on that one? Yes, I mean, that's, that's an excellent question. And it is also very accurate that oftentimes it is governments and, and Hungary and, and Orban are good examples of purveyors of disinformation and, and misinformation. Now, what we can do about it, I think, you know, there are multiple levels to that answer, but if we're focusing on the, the role of social media in this, I think we need to ensure that social media platforms engage um, fairly across any actor that is spreading disinformation on that front and ensure that the policies that are imposed in relationship to um, far right actors or far left actors, actors those who share disinformation are, are equal. The second and most important thing here, and this is why it's, it's important to fight for freedom of expression, is finding other means of purveying information within our societies and creating empowered, whether they're social media, uh, news-based websites, or fully independent news websites that can share counter narratives and making sure that that is built into our political systems on that front. So I'll, I'll stop there to create. Thanks, Lady. Thank you. Yes, so now, uh, and hopefully uh, we're, we're solving our sound problems as we go along. Maria, uh, it's time for your own uh, intervention, uh, hearing a little bit more about the role of the European Parliament. Uh, over to you. Uh, if you could do it in five minutes, I'd be grateful uh, because we've got some questions already coming in for the discussion period afterwards. But Maria, time for your intervention. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, uh, I will be in short. Polls, yesterday the extreme right obtained 20% of the votes in Sweden. And the polls for elections in Italy next 25th of September are, are very good for the extreme right. They have passed the extreme right from 4.3% in 2018 to 22.3% in 2022. Okay. As noted in the, by the Freedom House, in every region of the world, democracy is under attack by populist extremist groups, mainly extreme right uh, wing groups, that uh, of course reject pluralism, but uh, also seek to cast distrust and disaffection of citizens towards the democratic institution. And as I said uh, before, it would be a simplification to attribute all that just to this information, there is a, a, a deeper uh, re reasons for that. But, but what is true is that online misinformation is a key instrument, functional 
to this fact of the growing presence of the extremist groups in the government and the, in the governments and the institutions. Then uh, uh, this is why this the misinformation, disinformation, and the impunity of this information. And this is the consequence of the many, many loopholes and gaps in current legislation and policies at national and European level. Because this is um, the, the online misinformation is a breeding ground for malicious political interference benefiting extremist populists and anti-European uh, parties. There is a, a chapter in a, in a book, in a study, The Routledge Companion to Media Disinformation and Populism, that uses a concept that I like because I think that is very, I think that we are uh, putting a framework to, the, to this phenomenon. And this, this is the concept of information disorders as an extreme right tool. There are other tools that uh, fake news, propaganda, memes, uh, warfare in uh, memes as warfare in digital platform. But this uh, information disorders is a, is a new is a new battle camp for a political battle camp and um, and this is true that a little very little regulated regulated global and and open space put at the disposal of digital services providers and the, and to the disposal of political actors for business for lucrative entertainment for political activity and also malicious political uh, foreign interference and disinformation, this little regulated space constitutes a threat for our societies, values, individual rights as voters, as also as uh, customers and consumers. And uh, these technologies and platforms offer tools to the bad guys who normally try to, to increase divisions and influence elections or get uh, economic uh, profit. But um, as uh, uh, the Commissioner Jurova has said, this, uh, this is part of the anti brussels anti-establishment agenda of these um, extremist groups linked to Russia as main interferer and disinformer um, actor, even if we cannot if, even if the if the line the, the border between foreign interference and internal actors trying to take advantage yeah. of this yeah. open platform uh, is blurry is even growingly blurry this is the situation and which is the solution is very difficult the european union has not has not the competences to deal um, at the legislative level on that, there are different approaches from the, 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 the member states, and um, in any case, there is an embryo of, uh, of legislation. There is the Democracy Action Plan. There is a strengthened code of conduct for platform, platforms and, uh, and digital services providers signed very recently in June. Uh, there is the Digital Service Act and the Digital Markets Act. Yep. Then. Uh, 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 with all that, we are trying to put a limit to this open space uh, through, we can, we can discuss after, I, I'm sorry if I am extending myself, but we can, we can look for solutions to these problems through the legislation, taking, being aware that these are very difficult to have, to have uh, a common solution. Yep. Maria, thanks, thanks, thanks very much. And of course, you did point out that when it's endemic, you know, in the structure of uh, politics in the Western world with populist parties and more uh, extremist parties on uh, either side of the spectrum, um, with state control of the media and so on, uh, it, it becomes more difficult, of course, to, uh, to deal with uh, naturally, just like we obviously discovered that if it's linked to times of economic uncertainty, it's also difficult to deal with. But you pointed out in terms of what the EU is doing that that doesn't mean to say that we're helpless in terms of at least working on those areas where we can be uh, successful in terms of regulation and the rest. Uh, Maria, thanks. Um, so we've heard from our three speakers. Um, and uh, now, as I've said, there's time for a discussion discussion uh, and so I want to hand it over to you dear audience thank you for waiting patiently uh,
Hadish, Hadish, if I pronounced the name correctly, uh, uh, did indicate in the chat that uh, he or she would like to come in. Uh, so, uh, Etanesh, if you're still out there, uh, uh, I'm passing the virtual microphone to you immediately to put your question to the speakers. Now I hope you can hear me. Uh, yeah, good. Yeah, you're great. Great. Uh, fantastic. Yes, we can. I can at least. Uh, so please go ahead. Thank you for the possibility uh, to jump in. And I have to excuse uh, because uh, we have a big discussion in TV about the Commission Nuclear Waste. And so uh, I'm late. So, sorry. Uh, I want to talk uh, about... Etienne, can you introduce yourself just to let us know who you are? Uh, very briefly, of course, not your whole life story. I'd love to hear that, but we don't have time. <laughs> but just let us know who you are. I'm Rita Schwarze Sutter. I'm the Parliamentary State Secretary of the Foreign Ministry of Interior and Community. And uh, I want to talk a little bit uh, and faster about the role of uh, disinformation and how do online platforms contribute. Uh, Rita, to the it's process. you. I do apologize. Uh, we, we seem to have a jump. I had the name Etanish Hadish came up. Forgive me. Okay. You're probably totally confused why I was mentioning okay. this name. And then when I, the camera came on, I realized it was you. Uh, uh, Rita is the uh, State Secretary, Parliamentary State Secretary uh, in the German Interior Ministry. So, Rita, I know who you are and I can introduce you. Uh, so, please. <laughs> Now go ahead and thank you for joining us today. Great to see you. I thought I, I, I used the situation. Okay, thanks. <laughs> you used a, a false flag to confuse me. Go ahead. Disinformation and uh, conspiracy ideology and net narratives uh, contribute uh, greatly to the radicalization of parts of the protest uh, movement aimed at the government's uh, measures to combat uh, COVID-19 um, pandemic. The scene is now actively looking for new issues that can be used uh, to mobilize others. Uh, within the scene, uh, it is already being uh, discussed uh, whether to initiate uh, or exploit protest over economic and social problems in autumn and winter. You can think about uh, the energy, energy supply, energy security, And this minority are uh, made up of right-wing extremists, um, you call it Reichsbürger, people questioning the uh, legitimacy of the state and uh, supporters of uh, conspiracy theories, is also um, using issues such uh, as uh, the war in Ukraine and the resulting sanctions um, against Russia, increasing prices, inflation and measures that may be taken again uh, to combat the coronavirus pandemic to recruit new followers and cyber attacks and disinformation can be catalysts and Russia using these to polar polarize society in Germany and to destabilize democracy and I think that's really a danger. The dissemination of pro-Russian narratives continues to be high and is issued and spread in a relevant extremist forms. And if me are low, then I would also talk about what is the scale of the problem? What are the differences with uh, in Europe on what the authorities can do uh, to address uh, this issue? When trying uh, to assess, this, the, assess the scale of the challenges that come with uh, disinformation, both quantitative and qualitative aspects must be considered. This entails uh, specific posts and the nature of their narratives. Both must be seen in relation to the target audience. How many people are reached actually believe the disinformation and maybe even uh, repost it. However, uh, reliable data is not, a low, is not always uh, readily available to uh, properly assess and possibly react uh, adequately and in time. And authorities rely much on platform providers to supply suitable data as well as to inform, enforce both community rules as well as national law. Depending on the specific uh, narratives and uh, pieces of uh, disinformation, different organizations, companies or authorities must be enabled and enable themselves to be alerted on relevant disinformation and assess them quickly. So uh, I think uh, 
that's it's really uh, yep. a challenge. Yep. Yeah, indeed. So um, and then we can jump in the question, asking questions. Yes, thanks. Uh, uh, Rita, thank you, thank you very much for for that perspective, and thank you for for, for joining us. Uh, it, it's great to have you all with us uh, uh, today. Um, and I'm sorry because you've got such great experience, of course, that I couldn't give you more time uh, for that interesting intervention. It's just that we are now in the Q&A session and I did want to bring in, uh, for example, uh, Pascaline uh, Gabarit. Uh, Pascaline, uh, I see your hand up, so hopefully you are still there uh, and yep. you are ready to intervene with a question. So please go ahead um, and uh, please speakers hold fire for the moment. Let's uh, just collect some of those comments and I'll turn to you again uh, for your answers in a moment. So Pascaline, the uh, microphone is yours. Yes, thank you very much. I'm Pascaline Gaborit, Pilots for Death. Uh, I think we are facing two different battles here, if I may. I think the first one is the right of the citizens to access um, right information. And I think this is something like a huge challenge because there is disinformation not only on the social media, but on a lot of topics like energy, like uh, security, like immigration. So there are many, many difficulties and I, I really liked the, the comment and the suggestions from uh, Paddy Couran who had kind of concrete suggestions to uh, to work on this but there is also a second battle which seems uh, even more difficult which is to protect the democracy uh, especially in Europe and I think this is the real problem because this is the real danger from the far right uh, radicalization and this is not only linked to disinformation in my opinion this is also linked to distrust in the current institutions so I think we are not going to fight against radicalization and disinformation only in fighting against disinformation. I think it will not be sufficient. I think that there is going there there is a need of also positive messages to uh, promote the current institutions and the democracy. Thank you very uh, much. Pascal, thank you for that observation. I'm sure you're right. Yes, I mean shutting down sites as we've done with uh, jihadist groups in the past trying to take them offline they tend to sort of like mushrooms proliferate elsewhere censorship uh, well necessary may be uh, particularly if these are incitations to hatred uh, and violence but 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 you're right repression uh, dealing with any problem uh, rarely works all by itself so positive incentives look at the uh, rebuilding trust in democracy a uh, very valid point i'll ask the speakers to comment on that uh, just uh, another question briefly before i pass the floor back to them uh, again from one of our young debating europe uh, listeners the debating europe listeners have been super active today so thank you for that uh, we've got christina who asked whether social media platforms such as youtube twitter and facebook should be doing a better job at filtering and preventing disinformation and conspiracy theories from spreading. Well, Sasha re referred to this right from the get-go and, uh, and uh, made it clear that uh, the social media companies often come up with very nice sounding guidelines and rules of the road and codes of conduct and assure us that uh, they're getting uh, lots of people hired to spot the fake news and the disinformation and deal with it, but still the stuff keeps filtering through. So Sasha, I'm sure that you <laughs> want to come back uh, perhaps in more detail uh, to answer uh, Christina's question question but we had the intervention from the state secretary the intervention from Pascaline and finally from Christina looking at the clock that means that I now have to turn to our three speakers to respond to those questions and please in uh, just two minutes each you could do it uh, present us with some concluding thoughts uh, from what you've heard from each other and from what you've heard from the viewers today so Sasha can I go back to you please first Thanks so much, Jamie. I just wanted to absolutely second what Rita said in terms of the analysis. It's absolutely what we're seeing in our digital analysis of the disinformation ecosystem in Germany and elsewhere, um, that reinforcing and exploitation by hostile states of the domestic space and, and the bleed between protest movements um, and uh, extremist movements, as I said, conspiracy and uh, hate really combining to make for a much bigger problem than we had before even the pandemic. Um, and I, I just want to put this into the context of, of the bigger picture here, because a number of people have spoken to this. There was a question about Hungary and what we do. We are in a geopolitical struggle um, really between liberal democracy and authoritarian nationalism. And where the extremist groups and the hostile state actors or the conspiracy groups overlap in terms of the meta narrative, it is ultimately to undermine trust in liberal democracy and institutions internationally and to reinforce sort of pro authoritarian ideas. Um, and it is interesting, there is a playbook of authoritarian nationalism that we've seen 
play out with almost no response from the international community in places like Hungary. And there is, of course, more geopolitical political action to be taken when you see them do the playbook, which is trolling of the information ecosystem, setting up their own alternative information ecosystem, then progressively undermining the independence of state institutions, the judiciary, um, the civil service, and so on, until it's sort of democracy emptied out of meaning from within. Majoritarian democracy, authoritarian democracy, on the rise absolutely everywhere. The nature and shape of the internet, what we decide to do in terms of regulating this space will determine the shape of the battle between authoritarianism and liberal democracy. And, and this is where I say, while censorship is the response of authoritarian states to online problems, and of course we must remove illegal content, we are not talking in the, in the most about illegal content yep. here, but gray area content, which of course sensorial response cannot um, be applied to in a liberal democratic context. What we need instead is, as a liberal democratic web, we need to see accountability and transparency, regulated accountability and transparency. That is the direction of travel of the Digital Services Act. Sasha, I could really listen to you, and I say this with utter sincerity, I could really listen to you all day on this because you're endlessly okay. fascinating, yeah. but the clock is working against me, Sasha, so I'm going to have to sort of ask you to stop there. I'm really yeah. sorry, but I just want to no give worries. Fanny and Maria, uh, and course. maybe Rita, if you're still online, Rita, because it was good to have you join us today, uh, a chance of a concluding sentence. Uh, so, uh, Fanny, uh, please, uh, again, just a, a minute or so, uh, just any sort of concluding thoughts and things that maybe you thought about when you heard the questions? Yes, and it's this is a topic that's hard to talk about in an hour, but what I would want the audience to remember are four quick points. The ah, first is great. that we need a renaissance for democracy, and that goes beyond just fighting radicalization, but also rethinking the systems and, and the architecture of information around us. The second thing the audience need to remember is we need, as, as Pascaline spoke to, we also need to look at the broader systems. Many people today live in fear. Uh, climate change causes a lot of anxiety, people losing jobs and economic dysfunction, corrupt leadership. And we need to also think about how we change our systems to rebuild that trust in society. And then we go to the more detailed point, which is social media platforms being amplifiers just of, of radicalization, just like you had parties at a certain point were amplifiers of COVID-19, uh, the virus spread. Uh, social media platforms are amplifiers of the virus of radicalization because of how they're designed and need to be redesigned and there are solutions to that. And then the last piece is figuring out who are the bad actors that are manipulating both the dysfunctions in our systems and the failure of social media platforms to cause more harm and chaos in our society. And we need to target them and figure out ways to, to stop them from doing that harm. So those are the four pieces to keep in mind. Fairly fantastic. You're doing my job in providing a, a brilliant four-point uh, summation of what we discussed. Uh, thank you for that. By the way, in my introduction, ladies and gentlemen, at the beginning, I forgot to mention that Fadi is a former uh, European uh, or MENA, uh, Middle East, North Africa, Friends of Europe, young leader uh, too. So uh, Fadi, uh, forgive me for that, but you also have a, a background with Friends of Europe. So uh, uh, let's then go to Maria. Maria, uh, some again, one minute if you don't mind, some concluding thoughts on what you've heard. Uh, Rita, if you're still with us, uh, one minute after that, and that really, ladies and gentlemen, will bring us to the close today. So Maria, please. Yeah, thank you. Okay, I will be brief this time. Uh, the point is very worrying and is high in the, in the European Union's agenda. Tomorrow, in the debate of the State of the Union, uh, the President of the Commission, Mrs. von der Leyen, will mention that in the framework of the disinformation, in the framework of the, of the war in Ukraine, but she will mention the, the point of disinformation as a problem for the European Union. There is, um, there are different, as I said before, different approaches from the governments. The most liberal approach that uh, thinks that we only must to, to limit the illegal content of the platforms, or the, the more in, intervenient approach that we have also to intervene in the harmful content. But there is a discussion on the freedom of expression 
that we should no, not attack the freedom of expression by controlling the, controlling the, yep. the platform. Don't throw the baby yeah. out with the bathwater, as we often say yeah. in my country. But uh, in any case, freedom of expression must not be misinterpreted as freedom to engage in online activities that are illegal in the in offline that such harassment, hate speech, racial discrimination, terrorism, violence, um, all that is illegal offline, that should be illegal online. Got it. Then As... We cannot con uh, confuse that. And there is, a, I will finish with that, uh, we, we have room of maneuver in the European Union because there are the creation of a center of, um, for, the, for the control of this information at European level to share intelligence services, not just information, but intelligence services to promote the, the digital literacy, to promote and protect the serious journalism. Maria. There are funds for that, and uh, this is uh, what the European Thank Union you, Maria. is Thank you, Maria. Thank you. Maria, again, I'm really sorry because all of you have so many things to say. We really should have programmed two hours for this debate. Rita, if you're still with us, one sentence, please. It has to be one sentence, but uh, it's only fair because you made a very thorough uh, intervention too to give it to you. But it has to be one sentence, otherwise I'm afraid the system will shut down. Uh, I don't want that to happen. Please. Uh, first, I think I would uh, fully agree with uh, Sasha. Uh, we need accountability and also transparency. We should implement uh, the DSA very, very soon. And uh, the third thing I would uh, want to say is we need a lot of uh, political education. That's a uh, um, po central point, uh, and we should also work on this. Thanks. Thank you a lot. Well, ladies and gentlemen, thanks for following us today. I'm sorry that we had a few technical glitches with the sound, but thanks for uh, staying uh, in, the, uh, in the game. It was well worth it because we had some great speakers, some fascinating insights. I learned a lot, and if I've learned a lot, I dare uh, presume that you learned a lot as well. I don't have time for my usual uh, eloquent summary, unfortunately. Uh, I think Faddy, who definitely is going to be invited to be a moderator in a future uh, Friends of Europe debate, with his four points, probably summed it up where I think we came out in terms of looking at the health of our democracy, in terms of dealing with those factors of fear and anxiety that come from events like COVID or uh, economic difficulty, energy prices or the war in Ukraine. Uh, clearly a lot more to do uh, with our social media uh, friends. Uh, and finally, yes, uh, bad actors, whether we like it or not, are, are taking advantage of this to undermine and exploit us. We have to be realistic about that and find ways, whether legal or political, uh, to uh, deal with them. But uh, uh, I, I, we could barely touch the surface of a fascinating debate in an hour, but we did at least touch the surface. So again, thank you to my Friends of Europe uh, team uh, here at Town Hall Europe for putting everything together. Thank you again, uh, dear audience, for uh, staying the course. Uh, thanks for the good questions. And to, to the three plus, uh, I include Rita, the three plus speakers, uh, Sasha, uh, Maria, uh, Fadi and, and Rita. Thank you so much for giving us the impulsion, as they say in this town, uh, that got us going. I look forward to the next uh, Policy Insight. But for now, we're over time. We're out of time. So goodbye uh, from Town Hall Europe.